when Rachel first invited me to to give a talk, she basically said you can you can talk whatever you want to talk about. So um, I had to think about that, and, and I came up with the Osmington White Horse, uh, which is near Weymouth. Why did I choose that? Well, firstly, I wanted to, choose to talk about something which was landscape archaeology, so I, I don't do digging. I wanted it to be at the seaside, because I haven't been to the seaside for a year, and I wanted it to be as far away from D House and the amphitheatre and anything Roman. I want to be as far away as possible from any of that. So we're off to the seaside, we're, we're breaking out of lockdown, and I'm going to talk about this project, which I undertook for English heritage back in 2011, a whole, whole decade ago. It's remarkable. It, it is exactly 10 years since I, I first went to this uh, particular location, which, as you can see from the map, is on the south coast, it, uh, very close to, to Weymouth. And as Rachel said, it's a white horse figure and known as the Osmington White Horse, and there is a clue there in the name. But there is a story about this horse which will unfold through this talk. It has an element of mystery about it. It's a little bit Agatha Christie-ish, includes a little bit of jeopardy, a bit of mystery, a bit of fact, well I hope a bit more than a bit of fact, a lot of fact, and some fiction. So as well as archaeology, it has a number of ingredients to make this an unusual piece of landscape archaeology. Let's take a, a little closer look at where it is. On, on, at the bottom end of the Google Earth image, you can see there's Weymouth Bay there. You can see the sea and the White Cliffs. And in the centre of the top centre, if you follow my cursor up, you'll see the Osmington White Horse. You can see it's only a few kilometres, three or four kilometres from the, from the sea. Weymouth is down here and Osmington is that village there. So my talk will be concentrating on this White Horse figure here. Now, to understand something about a hill cut, chalk cut figure, we have to understand something about topography. It is a, it is a landscape and um, to understand hill figures, you have to understand something about the topography, the geology and the landscape. It is cut into a steep escarpment which runs along here. It's an outcrop of chalk along here. It's known as the South Dorset Ridgeway. It's a well-known long distance walk along the top of the, the ridge there. It's visible from the sea down, down here and nice tidy package. If you're in Weymouth, you can see it. If you're on the main road out of Weymouth coming along here, you can see the figure. If you're out in a boat in Weymouth Bay, you can see the figure. So the whole focus of visibility for this monument is in this sort of triangular area down here. So why did I why did I go down there? Well, it's important to, to have a reason to go and do, do some work, as we all know. Um, and the, I'll, I'll very briefly sum up what happened. We're back in 2011. And if you remember, in 2011, the country were, was gearing up to a major national event, which was the Olympic Games. And one of the big events of the Olympic Games was the sailing competition. And guess where that was going to be held? Down here in Weymouth Bay. Well, the local residents of Osminton and the Osminton Society and their community archaeology group wanted to ensure that Osminton White Horse, which could be seen from the sea, was in a good state of repair, as it would appear of no doubt many television shots, aerial shots, and in the background of the sailing shots. So they, basically they wanted to do a bit of um, grooming on the horse, but it was actually a little bit more than grooming that was needed because 
this particular hill figure has suffered years and years of erosion on the hillside. It was not very well looked after. In fact, nobody was looking after it. And it had found its way onto the Heritage at Risk Register. So all in all, it was, a, it was in a poor state of affairs and something needed to be done about it. The Osminton Society uh, got in touch with English Heritage for obvious reasons. It's a scheduled ancient monument. And they also got in touch with the Ordnance Survey who thought they thought might be able to offer some help in terms of um, working out something to do with its outline. And at this stage, I wasn't involved at all. This is the very early days. Just to give you an idea of the, the figure on the escarpment from an oblique view, you can see how steep that escarpment is. Even going up and down it on foot is very hard work and, and working on it is, e is even harder, believe me. It's a very, very escarpment. The figure is approximately 100 metres by just short of 100 metres, if you put it in that sort of square. So it's, it's quite a large figure. This is, you've got the hill figure. It's not in a particularly good state of repair and the local archaeological group and um, society, Hosmington Society wanted to reinstate its original outline. Seems a fairly simple request. Well, it is if you happen to know what the original outline looked like. And that is where the story starts to unfold. Well, Rachel said that it was cut in 1808. Well, that wasn't what was thought when the project started. A preliminary assessment was done of the evidence that um, told English Heritage, the Osmond Society and everybody else that chose to get involved, what was going on. Dorset County Council were, were, were asked to do a kind of preliminary study, an archaeological study of, of what the hill figure might have looked like when it was originally cut. So when was it originally cut and, and what was the understanding of it? Well, there were a number at that time, there were a number of dates for its cutting. Just let me just let me uh, run through some of them for you because it'll give you some idea of just how confusing this monument was at this state of play. A number of uncertainties and dates uh, uh, which have been put forward for this particular monument. Firstly, that the figure on the horse, and incidentally, this is the only hill figure in, in the country that has a rider, believe it or not, it's, the, it's unique in that respect. Well, the belief was it was George III on his favorite mount called Adonis, and that, that the hill figure had been based on a painting by the royal artist Sir William Beechey, who produced a well-known painting, which is in the top right of the images there, um, when he was inspecting the Royal Dragoon Guards in 1798. There's a second theory put forward that it was actually cut, the figure was cut by a soldier, by one soldier who was stationed at Weymouth and was to commemorate his visits to Weymouth. George III liked to go and take, take bathing in Weymouth, it's his favourite seaside resort. And that it was cut sometime between 1789 and 1805. Another theory was it was cut in 1815 by a group of military engineers. There's another one, which is where we enter the realms of, of fiction, because the monument is mentioned by Thomas Hardy in a novel called The Trumpet Major. For, and if anybody's read it, um, I'm sure you'll be able to quote from it, but I can't remember details of things like that. So I'm going to read a little bit from the Trumpet Major about this particular white horse. Remember this novel was written in 1880. And this is a quote from, from the book. I see little figures of men moving about. What are they doing? Cutting out a huge picture of the king on horseback in the earth of the hill. The king's head is to be as big as our mill pond and his body as big as this garden. He and horse will cover more than an acre. This is a, a narrative between two of the, the heroine and, and, and 
and John Loveday, the, the trumpet major. When they reached the hill, they found 40 navvies at work, removing the chalk sod so as to lay bare the chalk beneath. The equestrian figure that their shovels were forming was scarcely intelligible how they were close. And after pacing from the horse's head down his breast to his hoof, back by the way of the king's bridle arm, past the bridge of his nose and into his cocked hat, I'm sure you can see all these details on the um, the survey of the of the figures it was in 2011 on the on the top left there, don't you? Anne said she had enough of it. Short clearing upon the grass, the trumpet major had remained all the time in a melancholy attitude within the rowel of His Majesty's right spur. Quite a lot of detail there, and you can say that was written in 1880 and. Because that particular episode was set in the date 1805, fact and fiction have got merged because that date was also quoted for its cutting as 1805. And that date was taken from that Thomas Hardy narrative. So you can see from that, that even in the understanding of the scheduled monument and why it was scheduled, nobody really quite knew when it was cut and what the context was for its cutting. Also, there are a number of attributes that the figure had had a, a, a number of iterations that it were, as well as being George III. It was also Wellington, Kitchener and Montgomery. So it, it wasn't quite as straightforward as, as it seemed. And so when somebody says, can you reinstate the original figure? What was the original figure? When was it cut? What was the evidence? Now, the preliminary study that was done basically relied on three principal sources of information. First of all was a survey of the outline that was done by Oxford Archaeology, which is there on the top left, which represented the state of the monument in 2011. It looks more like, looks more to me, more like a white elephant um, that's done 10 laps of entry than a, than a white horse. You can see it looks nothing, nothing at all in places. Um, it was a study of postcards done, and here's one postcard from 1911 showing the image, and a little bit of art history. That's the painting by Sir William Beechey that I, that I mentioned early on, 1798. Now, the, the provisional study that was done said that basically on the evidence that was available, the best image to reinstate, it reinstate was this 1911 photographic image here. But one of the problems that arose that relating that image to the image that you see on the left, which is the reality of the ground, technically was impossible. Um, Various people tried various things, Oxford Archaeology Unit tried photogrammetry, various people tried, nothing would work because nobody really understood quite the relationship between some of the features on that and some of the features on, on that. And so the Osmington Society got in touch with the Ordnance Survey because they're the mapping organization. And the Ordnance Survey was, well, you know, replied we don't think we can do much about it. Um, and the Ordnance Survey contacted me. It's a bit like, you know, I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody else. It's called passing the book <laughs> in, my, in my business. So it, it landed on my desk as, a, as an investigator in English heritage. So I went to have a look. And then the game started to, to change slightly. The figure on the right is a, an aerial image that was taken of the hill figure in 2006. And you get some idea of just how much erosion had taken place. Look at the legs, look at the, look at the, the figure on the horse. It's all a bit messy. It, it's no shape to the outline of the, of the rider. It's, it's a bit of a mess. You could understand why the Osmington Society wanted to, to have it 
somewhat back in its regal glory, seems that the the Olympics was a major world event and, and patronised and viewed by members of the UK royal family as well. So how, how could, what could I do to help with the understanding of what was there on the ground with that 1911 image that the provisional assessment had said we needed to set out? So it's a question of going out and having a, a look in the good old fashioned way. If you look at the image on the left, I'm just changing the screens there. Can you see, that's from LIDAR, that's the escarpment. You can hopefully for you, you can see the outline of the hill figure on the escarpment there. But what you can see, hopefully, is that it is not just an outline. It is not just a, a silhouette, a white silhouette. This isn't um, the image isn't colour, by the way. But it's not just a silhouette. There are lots of lumpy bumpy stuff. There are lots of earthworks. Well, that's the meat and drink to me. I'm an earthwork man, so the immediately I got there. What struck me was that the outliners had been surveyed, that one, actually didn't reflect what was there. And that's sort of a principal misunderstanding of hill figures. If you cut hill figures into a slope, they create earthworks. So you have to understand the earthworks as well as the outline of the figure. So I did a survey of the earthworks, which you see on the right hand side of the screen. Now, if you look carefully and look at the, the uh, key underneath it, uh, hopefully you'll see there are outlines of lots of things there. <laughs> uh, it, it was actually chock-a-block with different outlines of different things in different places. So which outline were we dealing with? Is this the outline of the hill figure that was set out sometime in the early 19th century? Or what was going on? So the mystery started to, the more I looked at it, the more mysterious and more interesting this monument actually gave me. The horse and the hill figure almost took on a life of their own. There's always something new to discover almost every day I was there um, surveying this particular monument. You can see in a bit more detail now with the earthworks drawn in, in hashes in good old fashioned way. It's a bit like a Roman fort or a medieval village. It's you, almost you have to detach yourself from the fact that it's a hill figure and treat it just like any archaeological site that has an earthwork signature on the surface. You look at the earthworks, you look at different periods, it existed over a period of time. People might have changed it, done things to it. You start to analyze it as an archeological site. And obviously one of the first things you do with an archeological site, particularly when it's got earthworks, is undertake a survey of it. So how does that relate to what we understood about it? Once I start to get into it, I realize that it wasn't as simple as the preliminary assessment. There was a lot, a lot more going on. And in effect, what I needed to do was to stand back from it, treat it like an ordinary archaeological site. First of all, understand what was going on on the ground. What did that tell me? Look at the historical context for it. We got all these different dates and, and different theories about how it was created. I needed to understand something about the context of the early 19th century, what was going on in Weymouth, what was George III doing, what were the Napoleonic uh, defensive forces doing around that area, all these things to establish the context for the, the cutting of the monument. I also had to delve into art history. If the, if the understanding was that this was based on a painting of George III by Sir William Beechey, i.e. the one you can see on the left of the screen, does that look anything like what was on the hillside? 
apart from the fact the horse is facing the wrong way and George III is facing the other way and there's lots of other people in the very how, how realistic is that you know is, that, is it is it fanciful so I had to sort of delve and, and almost um, delve into areas about history I'd never delved into before so it became a almost a multidisciplinary approach as you'd adopt for it for any archaeological site only you're dealing with with different concepts and and <clears throat> also with, with almost philosophical um, things as well in in relation to to fiction and artistic interpretation and uh, and it was all you know just a bit of a blur at, at some stage anyway one of the evidence sets that had been looked at in the preliminary assessment uh, was collections of postcards because this was a famous monument, um, highly visible. Many people had walked along the Ridgeway and many people came to Weymouth and, and bought postcards or took photographs of it. Well, a collection of these had been looked at in the preliminary assessment, but I, I spent a lot more time looking at them and looking at them in the context of modern aerial photography as well and trying to piece together in effect a timeline of images for this site and compare one image with another image and get some idea of even within the lifetime of photography the earliest photograph was um, 1883 as we can see there in the top left um, how it had changed through time. And I can't go through every one of the postcards and photographs I looked at. So there's only gonna be a small selection in this talk, but you will certainly get the idea of the importance of an evidence set like this for a monument of this, of this sort of character. But one thing was, was an enormous surprise to me, I have to say, that in that preliminary assessment that had been undertaken before I got there, Postcards have been looked at and photographs and the outline of the hill figure have been surveyed and, and in effect that pretty much um, was the sum total of, of that assessment. What did surprise me enormously that the historic maps hadn't been taken into account because um, because of my background as Rachel mentioned you know, I came from the Ordnance Survey Archaeology Division. Um, the first thing I ever do, um, almost before I, I, I get my pencil out of my pocket or drink my first cup of tea from a flask, is, is look at the old maps. It's the first thing anybody who's right-minded would do with, with any piece of landscape to look at. And I automatically looked at the first edition large-scale 25-inch map, which is on the screen there. And as you would expect, in 1886, my cursor is drawing round the hill figure as it, as it was surveyed in 1886. If I go back to the postcards for a second on the top left, there was a photograph taken in 1883. Although it's in the distance, those two dates are only three years apart. So we can see from the, going back to the historic map, the figure that was surveyed on the hill at 25 inch scale was there at that time. Let's look at that in a little bit more detail. On the left is that image blown up. And you can see there is actually quite a lot of detail in that outline. Importantly, let's have a look. Let's go and sort of navigate round it a little bit. We can see we've got, starting from the nose, as it were, head, two ears coming round the neck. We've got appears to be a hand holding a rein there. We two reins, one wider than the other here. We've got something sticking up there. Is it another arm or is it a sword or a baton, something like that? We've got a cocked hat. We've got something sticking out the back of the neck, got something sticking out the back. We've got the shape of the horse with hooves, as you might expect, and we've got what appears to be a foot 
in a stirrup or something down here. Actually quite a lot of detail considering it was 25 inch scale map. And you can see on the images, the one in 1883 and the one in 1911, you can see some of those details. Even though the photographs are oblique, there's the foot in the stirrup, for instance. There's the hand on the reins, something coming up there. You can see the shape of the cocked hat. You can see what appears to be a large drop on the end of George III's nose there as well. So the map held some detail also to add into this equation. If you look at the subsequent editions of maps, um, and these are the different editions with the dates on, what you'll see actually is the shape never actually changed according to the maps. Now that tells a story in its own right. Does it mean that there was never any change or that the Ordnance Survey didn't map that change? Well, the shorter answer, is, the shortest answer is the horse did change, but the Ordnance Survey never, depict, never changed its depiction of that figure. Now that's partly because once the figure was on the map, the detail that changed in it was quite slight and wasn't sufficient for the surveyor to, to bother changing the shape of the hill figure because of the way it was represented in, in scale. And in fact, the only change to the figure uh, appeared on the 2011 digital 25 inch map, which by that stage it was starting to become eroded and the outline that was mapped was the eroded outline. So although the first Ordnance Survey map offered a fairly good representation of what was at that stage, that was still probably 70 or 80 years after we understood it was first cut. So going back to that depiction we had in 1886 and comparing it with the survey that I undertook in 2011 where clearly some of these detailed things sticking out the back. We have something, earthworks of something sticking out the back. We had something sticking out the back of the neck. We've got something sticking out the back of the neck. We start to see the shape of the, the hat a bit more. But there are other earthworks in here kicking about, which all are tending to suggest that perhaps there had been more changes than, than we understood. So what was the original outline? Let's look at the aerial photography of more recent years, see if that helps a little bit. So because we, we have more accessibility to, to aerial photography these days and monuments are photographed by many different agencies from the military through to the Ordnance Survey and, and private survey companies, there are a number of aerial images. These aerial images of the relatively modern day were very informative because what they did in effect was enable me to document changes that had occurred in the latter part of, of, of the 20th century. For instance, in 1949, we can see <laughs> somebody had gone through trouble of starting to clean the horse up and do things to it. And I think it's fair to say, you can see all the little piles of these white dots around the edge. These are all piles of material that have been cut. You see how crisp the edge to everything is. But this is very different to the earlier postcards and photography. It in, before 1949, it only had two reins. Now it's got four. Somebody's added another two reins in there. The shape of the ears has changed. And let's look between, even between 1947 and 1949. Look at the changes. They're very, very different. He's got a long pointed nose in 1949. He's got fingers sticking out of the hand, which aren't there in 1947 on the right hand side. 1947, you've got this thing sticking up here. Is it a sword or is it a batter? Barely see a trace of it there. Decided that wasn't worth cutting out by then or hadn't quite got round to it. Look at the changes round the spur area and the, around the foot. 
somebody's added a nice curvy bit up there. Interesting, but that is where the rowel and spur would be, the rowel and spur that were mentioned in Thomas Hardy's novel, if you remember from that extract I read out. So look at the context for 1949, it's post-war. It's, um, there's a new people are starting to, to settle down after the wartime period a bit. <clears throat> in 1939, 45, the hill figure was covered over. It was camouflage. It was hidden from view because the authorities believed it would be used as a navigation beacon for ships in Weymouth Bay. So it's camouflage. So it'd been invisible really for, for five or six years. And clearly by 1949, somebody had said, right, let's get this thing, you know, back on the landscape again. But in the process of doing it, they were adding things to it and changing it. And that process, we can document in other years as well. I'm obviously asking you to remember a lot of these changes. I can't put them all on successive image one after another to compare them. But if you remember the last images, there are more changes have taken place now between 1949 and 1968. Somebody's added another bit to the hat. There's a sort of pom-pom gets added to the top of the hat. The baton or sword is now visible again. You can see that by 1996, the nose has been extended even further. The chin has become pointed. We're starting to lose the image of the the foot and the spur down here. The four reins that were there in 1949, if you remember, are now only two by 1996. And it's starting to lose a lot of its edge definition. This is that process of erosion starting. Remember, it's on a steep slope, a very steep slope. And what happens, water flushes down the slope, you get erosion and earthworks start to slip. So it's in effect gravity is taking everything down the slope as well. So as well as all the changes that are going on over the years, which are being done by, by people, you've got the natural forces to contend with. So that has to be thrown into the equation. So then we get to the art history bit that I had to start researching and starting off with this theoretical George III on this theoretical challenger, a uh, charger called Adonis and this painting by Sir William Beechey. When I started looking into this in detail, I found that of course there were very few paintings of George III on horseback that anywhere matched the image that we've seen already. Um, there isn't one of him on horseback that looks in reality anything like that hill figure that's set out on the ground. On this famous painting, he's fa which is the one on the right, he's facing, he's, facing, he's facing to the right and the horse is facing to the left, whereas on the hill figure, both the horse and the figure face to the right. He's in silhouette on the, the hill figure, he's not in silhouette silhouette there. So yeah, it's a bit loose, a bit loose that, that suggestion that it was based on the painting, but we all know artists are quite capable of, of, of changing reality in any way they, they feel fit. But you know it's not a direct it wasn't a direct translation of, of an image from that painting. There is one image that I found of George III facing on a, on a horse facing to the right, which is getting a little bit nearer the hill figure that, that we've seen. <laughs> and that was painted in George's, uh, in uh, George III, and that was painted in 1765 by an art, a Swiss artist called David Morier, whose speciality was actually horses and figures on horses, but not necessarily did he do both. He, and it alternates between paintings where he does the military figure and somebody else puts the horse in and some paintings where he puts the horse in and somebody else puts the military figures in. But very much his paintings focus on military figures and horses. 
But nevertheless, this is getting a little bit more like the images you're seeing on the hillside. And more and more, David Morier's paintings became more and more interesting. But this is the only one that um, found for, for George III. However, and this is where they, the, the plot thickens, he did plenty of paintings of George II on horseback. Now, have a look at those, give you time to digest them for a minute. The one on the left How similar is that to the figure we've seen already, which you can see the, the portrayal by the Ordnance Survey in the top, the silhouette there. It's a silhouette figure, the posture's the same, the silhouette's the same. We've got something sticking out the back, which is the bottom end of a queue, which is in effect a false hairpiece that um, is worn by military figures and particularly royal military figures um, they wouldn't be considered properly dressed without this uh, adornment dangling down their back the horse has got two spiky ears sticking up his hand coming across there a baton in his hand there not sticking up but nevertheless a baton there the foot on the spur many many similarities it's now looking much more much more convincing that this might be the painting or a painting that resembles a figure on the hillside. But these are some of the other paintings of George II by David Morier, the middle one. Although it's not in silhouette, he's got a sword in his hand. And the one on the right is in silhouette, although it's facing the other way. But if you mirror image it you can see again we have we have something now approaching something that if somebody's got to set something out on the hillside they had something to copy from or work from which is how hill figures in this period were constructed there's another one in yorkshire called the kilburn white horse well, we have a record of how that was set out. It was cut, it was cut um, to effectively a, a template, uh, a scaled up from a drawing to measurements to be set out on the ground by tape and offset on and chains and offset in those days. Um, with mathematics, it was a you know it was a setting out operation on the hillside. Um, you have to have some kind of template to work to that you can scale up and portray what you want to portray. You need some way of, of translating measurements. It's not just guesswork when you're setting out something 100 metres by 100 metres on a hillside to commemorate a royal figure. You want it at least to look like something real. So the painting on the left looks very much like the template that was set out. And of course, we're dealing with a different monarch. So the whole thing is starting to come into question about the context for setting out. Was it, was it really dedicated to George III? Was it really, what date was it cut? Could it have been cut before George III came to Wayne? The whole these things suddenly, they became questions rather than, being able to rely on them as facts and, and the facts that underpin the preliminary assessment of this particular monument. Let's have a look at those collectively now. On the left hand side, top left, we have the painting by David Morier. On the right, we have the hill figure on an aerial photograph in 2006, which is eroded. Here's a, a photograph taken not long, not long before that, uh, a few years before that, when it was in much cleaner state before the erosion really set in. But what's the reality now between that and 
this. And to some extent, I think you'll, you'll, you'll probably see something quite interesting. It's why I've, I've put in a, 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 a comment, I suppose, at the bottom, all a matter of perspective and scale. Proportion of the figure on the left and the proportion of the horse are about right, as we would expect. But if you look on the right hand image, the proportion of the figure in relation to the horse, you see how extended? <laughs> about three times longer than it should be. And that's because when viewed from the ground on a sloping hillside, if you set the figure out in the real proportions, it would have almost been invisible. So to make it visible, you have to extend it to make it visible when viewed from the ground. Again, it shows how carefully this figure was actually set out as a, as a mathematical exercise. Anyway, together and I can't take you through every bit of evidence that there is but we started off with a preliminary assessment which then lots of new evidence emerged as we started to look at it from a survey point of view from architectural and, and artistic history aerial photo photographs and so on we had this figure on the left which is an earthwork with lots of iterations to it and lots of indications of lots of change the area of the photographs and postcards showed lots of change. So cutting through that, at some point, I had to sit down and say, well, what is the figure? What's the figure likely to have been in when it was set out? And, and when was it set out? Well, the definitive figure is the one on the right. That was the outline that um, from all that data, we digitally transposed into what the definitive outline should include and from all the evidence going around it bit by bit, examining every bit of evidence from all sources about what was likely to have been there when the figure was first cut. Well, when was it cut? As I said at the beginning, there were a number of dates and ideas, but part of that assessment meant looking at contemporary documents and in particular newspaper cuttings were particularly helpful um, and there were, there were three or four which clearly documented the fact it had been cut in 1808 and I'm only going to read out one to you because it's quite an important one it was published in on the 1st of November 1808 in the monthly magazine and I, I'll read it to you an equestrian figure of his majesty, which then was George III, mounted on his favourite great charger Adonis, has been formed in chalk on the hills of Osmington near Weymouth, belonging to Mr Wood of the former place. Although its length is 280 and its height 320 feet, yet the likeness of the king is well preserved and the symmetry of the horse is complete. It forms a pleasing object to the pedestrians on the Esplanade of Weymouth, but more especially to those who are fond of water excursions in the bay, where the view is more complete. Direct connection with the water, as you can see. It has been carried into effect under the direction of Mr Wood, bookseller, at the particular request, and this is important, this bit, at the particular request and sole expense of John Rainier, Esquire, brother to the late Admiral of that name. In other words, somebody paid for this monument from money bequested from the estate of Admiral Rainier, who coincidentally died a couple of months before this figure was cut and that report was written. He left a very large amount of money to his brother. And it seems to me, piecing everything together, that in reality, this monument is, in effect, it's not purely a monument to George III. That's the regal context at the time, but actually it's a monument to Admiral Rainier. And the context of the Napoleonic War, the context of Admiral Rainier, Rainier who'd fought in the Napoleonic War, the fact he died two months before, everything sort of comes together that 
between they decide to create a monument to all these things at one time. It's not actually George III that's portrayed. It's, George, it's actually from painting of George II, but it's meant to be George III because that's the context of the date when it was cut. But actually, it's paid for from the estate of somebody who's just died and many, many times sailed out of uh, Weymouth, Weymouth Bay as part of the, the, uh, the, the fleet of the, of the nation. So it's a much more complicated story than, than we ever actually imagined. So I've cut a long story short there to, to, to show you the complexity that can be embodied in a hill figure. And, and what we have to do with any hill figure is look at it as an archaeological monument. It's not just the outline of the figure, it's the context, it's looking at the fact it's been there a long time. It's never ever going to have not been changed. And there are many, many instances, as we found when I looked at this particular figure over the years, of all sorts of things being done to it and reports of things being to it. And I, you know, because I don't want to upset anybody, you know, of fragile nature, but many different appendages have been added to it over the years in, in, in the most inappropriate places. It's had all sorts of things um, added to it, even during the course of the Olympic Games in 2012, uh, after we'd reinstated this monument, things were added to it overnight during broadcasts by, by plastic sheeting. Um, and it's really interesting how the monuments that people see are an important part of reflecting culture, not just of when they're placed on the, on the landscape. You, know, you think of things like the Sir Nabus Giant, um, Uffington White Horse, we tend to see these fossilized as one monument in one time. You know, things like Uffington White Horse have been there for 3,000 years. You know, why pretend that in, in prehistory people didn't mess about, didn't put appendages on it that they thought were inappropriate? Because, hey, that's a good laugh, isn't it? People are human. People should do things to monument. I'm not saying they shouldn't deface them, but it's a fine line between defacing a monument from a purist point of view and adding a big nose to it because Montgomery had a big nose. Why not put a big nose on it if you want to celebrate winning World War II? Why not add a sword to a figure to make it, you know, ward off the French? Why not? What's wrong with doing that? Even on the Osmington White Horse, you can see here on this left-hand image, I hope, Somebody's put their initials, laid pebbles out and laid out their initials in between the, the forelegs of the horse. We have reports of the girl guides doing to it to cel celebrate the girl, gu girl guides um, centenary of some kind or another. I forget the exact date on that one. Um, and that was that was celebrated. But to some others, that's defacement. So we, we, we shouldn't be too precious about changing monuments and, and how we change them. That gives me a good cutoff point now say, well, there's all the research, that's how we understand it. And on the right is the definitive, computerized, digitally created, definitive outline that I want to put on the hillside. This is my, this is my time, instead of just recording monuments, this is my time to put a monument on the landscape. So this is, how do we physically go about that process? That's not an easy job in its own particular right. Let's have a, a look at that now. So once we thought we understood the monument, then working with the Osmington Society, the task was then, how do you put that shape, the definitive outline, how do you put that back on the hillside? Fortunately, there were lots of willing helpers and particularly we've been around Weymouth where you have the army and Navy and Royal Air Force are all somewhere close by. And it was a highly visible monument and obviously the context of the Olympics helped harness, no pun intended, helped harness the local communities 
uh, into getting involved and, and providing uh, muscle power. It sort of helps with the Army, Navy and Air Force, where asking for volunteers takes on a, sli a slightly different meaning, like you, 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 you will volunteer, this will be good for you. And there you can see lots of Army cadets who were helping in the first stage of the restoration, which is to get rid of what made it white, because that monument never was white. Chalk is very rarely pure white. And if you spend any time looking at this particular ridge, you will see even over the course of 24 hours, or so I should say daylight hours, the color can change from almost pure white in reflected sun to almost dark gray when it's cloudy. So these monuments never even are the same color. And unfortunately, in 1989, there was a television program. Don't you just hate television programs about archaeology? Program called Challenge Annika. And um, Challenge Annika was challenged to restore this monument when erosion was starting to take place in 1989. And what they did was placed on the natural chalk tons and tons of Portland white scalpings, i.e. chippings, stone chippings, which it never had. It had never had those in its life, but they were placed on that monument to make it white. So the first thing, oh, so I should qualify that by saying there was a trial um, excavation done here so that we understood the nature of what the that surface was and that confirmed that underneath the um, scalpings it was straight down to to bedrock and there was no sort of interface in between the two. So the first thing that had to be done was to get rid of 160 tons of scalpings by hand and that's where the cadets and volunteers came in. You can see the steepness of the escarpment and the cadets, they're digging in by shovel after shovel, putting the scalpings into white bags of a particular size, a laborious muscle breaking job. And uh, you can't underestimate how fatiguing that particular work was for them. And you can see from a distance there, the bags all lined up um, for one particular operation. That's just a selection of bags. Not all the scalpings are in there by any means at that stage, but you can see even there the difference in colour between the white bags, which are pure white, and the more natural colour of the chalk underneath. They're all stacked in bags like that for the next stage, which was to get them off. And because of the sheer scale of the operation, the only way to get them off was a helicopter taking a bag off at a time. Tremendous amount of um, goodwill from various agencies were, uh, it's just a, sort of a massive collective effort of willpower, organisation, logistics, and, and a fair amount of, of um, uh, cash, no doubt, paying for the fuel for the helicopter, but it was a tremendous operation to get those scalpings off before we could even get to the stage of setting out the definitive outline. You can see how ragged the edge is sort of in the background there. That's George, George III in the, in the background, as it were. So how did we do it? The definitive outline that I'd drawn um, basically existed at a series of, of coordinates in a computer digital map that I produced from all the evidence I'd got. And that was then translated into GPS coordinates onto the Ordnance Survey digital mapping. In other words, we took digitized images and translated that in a geographical information system package, a GIS package, into nodes, points with a coordinate, which in effect like joined the, joined the dots, created the outline of the hillside of the of the hill figure on the hillside so working with a surveyor from the Ordnance Survey John Horgan who's on the right there with his GPS kit 
this became a joint exercise between myself from English Heritage and the Ordnance Survey to put the hill figure back onto the map, as it were. Uh, two, two operations, one set out the outline on the ground so that we could cut the outline. Um, and secondly, that it could go on the map. And that could be done in one operation by uploading the coordinates for all those nodes into John's survey grade GPS, which will allow you to measure coordinates anywhere in the world to an accuracy of two millimeters. It's a, it's a very grown up GPS, that one, a bit bigger and a bit better than the one you've got in your car, obviously, and set those out on the ground. The figure on the left uh, is a kind of diagrammatic way of showing you what had to be done when we set the, the nodes out on the ground to create the digital outline that you see on the right there. The different colours, as you can see from the key, I hope. Uh, some areas had to be deturfed, some areas had to have vegetation removed, some areas needed returfing, some areas just needed trimming, so, some areas needed consolidating and boarding up because they had slipped down the slope. Uh, and so we went on. So that it, it was it was actually quite a lot of, of landscape gardening, in effect, had to be done once we got rid of all those scalpings. Well, how did we do it? In, in, in fairly simple terms, um, John would set up the GPS kit, set out a particular point on the ground, drop that point on the ground, put a peg in. We would follow along and join up the pegs with a tape measure and draw out the line with biodegradable spray paint. And basically, John would walk around the outline doing that, putting the points in, and we would follow around and join the dots with the yellow paint. And you can see the, the setting out team. There's the five of us working together, somebody from Dorset County Council, somebody from the, uh, one of the countryside rangers, and um, another helper from the Ordnance Survey there. And what on the right hand side, if you follow my mouse, hopefully, you can see that's the outline of the of the monarch's nose there, and that's his chin. And you can see that in some areas we have to de-turf, and in others we have to add turf. It's but the first stage was to set the outline out on the hillside. Team having lunch, the setting out team again. You can see we're sitting on on the monarch's right hand there, as it were, we are having lunch. But again, you get some idea of the scale of cutting out that had to be done by hand, all the deturfing had to be done by hand, and the scale of, of the earthworks and the, the ridge, a nice sort of setting to have your, have your lunch on in the, monarch's, in the monarch's right hand. So, um, as in typical fashion, we, we did all the setting out and, and uh, the drawing out of the outline and we got lots of young people with backs who are in much better state than, than ours to, to do all the digging. And this team was from a local school, um, a local girls school who came along to, to help out. And they're, they're trimming off the, the outline, as you can see there again. So this, trimming, cutting, deturfing exercise went on for, for many different weekends against the deadlines. It all had to be ready for the Olympic Games. It all happened over a period of, of about eight months from initial research to, to the final cutting out. Just in the background there, you, you can hopefully you can see, um, we're just ready to cut out the eye of the horse. That eye had appeared sometime um, after 1949 and it had to come out and that caused more upset to the locals than anybody else because as you can imagine in the local village um, many people and the majority of people wanted to see it restored but there's always there's always some people who oh no the eyes have been there ever since it was first cut and and even when you prove to them with photographs it wasn't they still refused to believe you so i took great pleasure in in deturfing that one myself because it never had an eye in it and there was no way it was going to to keep its eye so I contributed a little bit to the digging out by taking out the eye 
So by the time we'd finished, we'd started off with that on the left, eroded, looking like it had just done 10 laps at Aintree and looking very degraded, to that photograph taken from the air by the Ordnance Survey after we completed it. That's the finished article. And the one thing we didn't put back on that I mentioned right at the beginning was the rowel and spur on the end there because the earthworks of that rowel and spur quite clearly post-dated the original uh, cutting of the foot and the spur. They quite clearly have been added later. And if you remember, I showed an image of 1949 when I mentioned the rowel and spur on there. You could see them quite clearly during that rather dramatic image that I showed from the air. And I'm fairly confident they were added simply because they were mentioned in Hardy's trumpet major where they were um, sitting in the, the rowel on the, on the monument, the, the trumpet major and his, and his loved one. So it became a, a story of many different monarchs, well, two different monarchs anyway, um, well, almost three if you take the one on the left into account, uh, the Princess Royal, who officially unveiled the monument, if that's the right term to use. She arrived by helicopter, which was very appropriate to um, unveil the plaque, which was the official unveiling of the monument in the background. And of course, the Invitation was sent to uh, Princess Anne because of her connection with equestrian matters, her well-known connection with equestrian matters and the Olympic Games. And of course, this was one of her direct relatives who was embodied on the, uh, the hillside behind, which is why I entitled the report, The Osmington White Horse, A Regal restoration and if you want to read more about the detail more about the evidence and to get a lot more background than i can present in the time i've been able to talk to you about it there is a detailed report which is available as a free pdf on the historic england website and that's a, a photograph on the right hand side and and with that i will end this presentation <laughs>